Can I, can I just call you Audrey? Yeah, of Mr. course. Yeah. <laughs> no, just, just Audrey. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess we have another um, interview or from KBS. Yeah, I, I don't know whether it will be simultaneous. Or... Well, I asked not to. Oh, um, you asked not to. That would actually yeah, sure, reduce sure. the time to have Of course, of course. I just want to run your profile briefly for a fact-checking Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So, um, so you're, the, you're the youngest minister in Turkey? Right? Uh, at the moment, but not historically. Oh. Um, there was a minister of youth um, affairs, uh, Zheng Li Jun, when she went into the cabinet um, a few years ago, she was 34. So right now you're the... Right now I'm the youngest, 30, at 35. Yeah. And, um, and you're first transgender minister mm -hmm. in Taiwan. In the world. And, mm -hmm. the world. and you never went to mm -hmm. college? Yeah, I, I dropped out of junior high school when I was 14. 14. And when, when did you start your first company at the age of? Uh, 15. 15. Uh, I could check in. And um, your IQ is 180? That's, that's a rumor. My my, my my height is 180 cm. <laughs> it often gets confused. So what's your real IQ? For adults, uh, the IQ test only gets to 160, above which uh, the WISE test cannot uh, reliably test. So, so I am 160 or more, but I don't really know. I, I've tested twice and there's no way to know. And you, ha you started your Silicon Valley startup at the mm -hmm. age of 19. That, that's correct. What happened to the company? Well, it, it's still running. Uh, it was a um, like a angel investment by a lot of Taiwan companies. And then we continued our um, part of our operation in mainland China and part of it in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And it's still still running, but I, I no longer, uh, I'm no longer in charge of it. Wow. So we have a very impressive record right yeah. 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 Oh, I put into my jacket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, after meeting our channel, so he was really interested, interested in your philosophy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, have you ever come up with uh, Jordan Hollands? Who has yeah. Been, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know because you, you mentioned the deliberation mm -hmm. as a keyword of your yes. speech. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Like uh, William Hallmark said, he said uh, deliberate, uh, deliberate democracy, mm -hmm. which is the most important value mm -hmm. in this modern society. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a key, and yeah. I believe that you are actually realizing mm -hmm. the deliberate mm -hmm. model mm -hmm. mm -hmm. into the democratic system of Taiwan. So mm -hmm. we are very intrigued about mm -hmm. your progress. Yeah, the, the thing with the deliberation is that it's magical because right. when people enter into a high quality of deliberation, everybody walks out changed. Right. and then. Uh, people respect each other and they will become immune to the rumors, to the propaganda after a deliberation. The problem with deliberation is to, first, it's messy, meaning that every time you run it, there's no uh, established way to get high quality deliberation. And second, it doesn't scale, meaning that if it's 20 people, maybe you can get deliberation. If it's 200 people, it's impossible. If it's 2,000 people, people just start shouting at each other. So basically, listening, the key to deliberation, does not scale. Meaning that if it's more people, it actually loses its magic. So we use uh, ICT, information communication technology, to scale the experience of listening. That's our main contribution. I mean, that process, you actually adopted the machine learning technology into the listening, listening process. Yes. Right. So could you elaborate more about your, uh, your, your program, your software mm -hmm. that has been developed in order to gather mm -hmm. public opinion? Yes, of course. Um, so there are uh, 
this very important principle in the idea that we use the internet to deliberate on people's feelings, not their suggestions, not their decisions. Because if you jump into suggestions, uh, people will not reveal the feeling they have uh, behind the suggestion. So even though five people suggest the same thing or they vote the same way, maybe they do it out of different uh, subjective feelings. So what we uh, have crowdsourced before was people's feelings, for example, around one concrete issue, like a you know your own private car and you don't have a professional driver's license, but you use this app and then you get a stranger on your back seat and you drive them somewhere and you charge them for it without mentioning any company name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then uh, our software is an open source software basically ask people uh, one yes or no question and based on their uh, yes or no question they get clustered so after you answer a, a question whether you think insurance is important whether you think it's public safety um, your avatar moves on the screen so you can cluster uh, with people and this interface has two very important things first it shows your Facebook and Twitter friends uh, first so you can see if people having very different idea than you they are not anonymous enemies they're still your friends it's just you haven't talked about this over dinner right so it's not your enemy that's first and the second thing is that in internet forum it's very easy for these two polar sides to dominate all the discussion and these people are silent right because they shout uh, there always some right. focus. yes so but the thing here is that you can press consensus and see there's nevertheless 91 percent of everybody agrees the importance of checking of the driver's credentials of protecting the passenger <clears throat> so there can be consensus among disagreements and so this after you answer a few yes or no questions you can also type in your own feeling and then which then gets voted by other people so what we say before the deliberation was that if by the end of the process we have a set of agreements more than 80 percent of people agree on something then we agree to use this supermajority consensus as our national agenda to negotiate but with the, uber and with uh, other taxi how do you gather people's uh, opinion Mm -hmm. Like you said, you didn't listen to their suggestions, mm -hmm. you didn't listen to their uh, national opinions, mm -hmm. but you just kind of capture their feelings or their yes. uh, innate uh, yes. uh, uh, tendency to yes. a specific policy. So how do you gather the information? No, we just ask people to start the sentence here with 我觉得, which is I feel that, yeah. Yeah. and then that's it. So, so we're not passively monitoring, we're actively asking people to write their authentic feelings. Okay. And then this is a open-ended survey, so people can feel anything. But within that process, uh, people might really disguise or didn't really show, didn't want to show their mm -hmm. real feelings. That's right. So, so you might have to ask them twice or three times. That that's right. You can change your your positions anytime here, and then you can state more nuanced feeling because we only take as binding things that you manage to convince everybody. So. If it's a disguised or if it's a non-authentic feeling, if people don't share it, it, it doesn't have any effect. So people are basically competing to first convince people who think like them and gradually to convince people who doesn't think like them. And we only take the supermajority as the agenda. So how do you call that the system? Do you, do you so this system has a name called POLIS, P-O-L dot I-S. Is it hard to develop? Is it really taken a lot of resources to develop? Such a well, it is actually a, a community effort uh, started by some Seattle hackers, but it is open source, so everybody can contribute. So I also contributed to its development, and it was um, contributed usually by people who participated in a Occupy or a protest movement before. So like after the Occupy Wellington, the New Zealand people would join. And after, you know, the Occupy Wall Street, uh, Madrid, you know, these, every time after the Occupy, people start thinking, okay, democracy can take another form. And then these people will join this development. So the big moment for you in Taiwan is on the 2014 Sunflower? Mm, that's exactly right. So we started this development before the Sunflower, but we were not many people, a hundred or so. But after the Sunflower, it was just exploded in interest. 
소리는 두 손으로 하는 거예요. 시즌 그 캠프 이걸 방송에서 스타트를 하시는 거예요. 어떻게 지금 스타트를 하시는 거예요? 지금 이미 막 하고 계시는 거예요. 그 근데 어쨌든 카메라에 신경을 써주셔야 되기 때문에 지금 내용이 어떻게 되는지 지금 제가 지금 못 들었거든요. 그러니까 지금 어떤 질문들을 하시는 건지를 어떻게 보고 순서를 정하시든지 뭐 어떻게 하셔야 될것 같은데 모르겠습니다. 아, 질문 몇개 정도? 질문 좀 그냥 기본적인 거한 다섯 개 정도? 아, 저도 한한열개 정도 가져왔거든요. 네. 질문이요. 그 제, 일단은 제가 한 제가 한 그, 그렇게 하죠. 그럼 그러면 또 질문 하실 거예요? 그렇습니다. 아 끝나셨어요? 네. 그러면 그좀 전달해 주세요. 그러니까 네. 이쪽이 지금 네. 방송 인터뷰라고 네. 말씀 좀 주시고. 네. 이렇게, 이렇게 okay, yeah, I should, I should look at camera. Oh, <laughs> so you, you don't have to look at the camera, you can just look at us. Uh, okay. Uh, us just, just briefly, so is this platform, are you using for the Taiwan government? Are you using this platform uh, for the Taiwan government to gather public opinion? That's exactly right. Well, can you give me just one example of the latest initiative that you Mm -hmm. Well, the most high profile, of course, was the Uber case, but we also used the same for the Airbnb case for internet sales of alcoholic beverages um, and so on. Uh, and just uh, today, uh, Uber announced that they will bind themselves to the consensus that's made here, and they will change their business model starting tomorrow uh, to play by the rules that was set in the deliberative session. Well, how many people participated in the Uber survey? Uh, in the Uber survey, uh, thousands of people participated, but only around uh, 1,000 or so uh, log it in so that we, we can see their avatars. And they have answered more than nine questions so we can determine their position. So it's about, yeah, I would say uh, about 1,000 uh, active um, players, but about 9,000 or so uh, peripheral players. Actually, today I'm interested in two of the initiatives from your department, mm -hmm. and one of them is the the esports. I heard mm -hmm. that your department is planning to replace the mm -hmm. mandatory military uh, mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. to playing computer games. Is mm -hmm. that right? Can you tell us more about mm -hmm. this and why you are doing this? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, first, it's not about computer games. Uh, esport is a sport. It just happens so that. Uh, the stadium they use is a virtual one, not a physical one. But the point here is the competitional uh, sport aspect. Um, my favorite argument uh, in this conversation is that I think Go, uh, Wei Qi, the, the board game, uh, is now an eSport. Because most of the competition and training happens online. And also because machines now play better than human, so 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 this is mostly for two human beings to to enjoy each other's company and play for performance. And in this sense, it is really is not nothing um, different from other esports. So um, as for the alternative military service, it is true that it's already uh, this, the case for Go for Weiqi players in Taiwan. They can have alternative uh, military service if they win some uh, international or national competition awards. The same applies for any other sport as well as, uh, you know, um, like symphony uh, conductors and you know other cultural um, performance. So uh, eSport athletes being a cultural performer uh, in which has international competition and so on uh, shouldn't really be discriminated against. That was just the, the, the basic idea. So we're not actively promoting it. We're just saying you know this is like other uh, sport. Um, and the other thing that we used during the um, eSport thing is that we have on our previous website a accountability uh, trail where um, you can have this QR code that lists the entire um, decision-making process for how exactly this policy was formed. So starting from the public hearing down to the um, classes, down to the military service, down to the you know, national um, tax breaks and so on, uh, we have all the ministries and all the decision makers uh, in our internal meetings 
taken as a transcript with real time transcript, and everybody, after editing it for ten working days, agreed to publish it to the general public even before we have set our direction. And this is very important because then everybody, the esport athletes, all the stakeholders, look at our uh, conversation deliberation records and let us know over the internet where we have missed, where there's legal precedent for that, and so on. And so they were contributed, and I quote them on the next meeting, and so on. So everybody knows uh, that when all the three lights here uh, goes from yellow, which means it's in progress, to green, which means it's resolved. We have resolved this policy case, and it's one piece of the puzzle is the uh, military service, but there is also the educational uh, aspect and also the industrial aspect. So these are a complete picture. This is not just one isolated uh, policy making. So what are the like two most popular esports game in Taiwan, and how far you have to perform in order to be mm -hmm. replace the mandatory military. Right, exactly. Uh, there are ten uh, criteria uh, spots. So, uh, of course, if you uh, win a Olympic level competition, that kind of automatically qualifies. But even for sports like LOL, there there is actually no. Um, like frequent Olympic level uh, competitions. So the next thing, of course, uh, is the um, the alliances um, between the different countries. So we set a um, basic criteria that says it has to be regular and it has to have at least this many people in its regional and this many people in its uh, national level and so on. If you qualify for that, there's a few competitions for LLL that qualifies for that. If you win the, the first uh, three places or so, that also qualifies. Uh, and then after that, it was uh, about the national level competitions, which still has to have some kind of structure. So this is a three-tier system. Uh, but still, only the you know professional players get to uh, continue their work uh, during this kind of alternate service. Where so we're not rewarding video game players; uh, we're rewarding professional athletes. Another initiative I'm interested in knowing is that your uh, country is starting to educate the children about how to identify fake news at mm -hmm. school starting next year. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us why do you think it's mm -hmm. important to educate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we don't use the words fake news because I think it is a disservice to journalism. <laughs> uh, there are rumors which are viral, which means people who spread it doesn't bother to check. But it's not necessarily false or fake. Some rumors turn out to be true. The, the point here is that people uh, need to learn to do basic source checking, fact checking, and balance uh, of diverse set of uh, opinions and so on, basically critical thinking and independent thinking. So in our curriculum, we call it information technology and media literacy. Uh, so this idea is not about spotting quote, fake news, unquote, but about being able to make decisions and make uh, opinions of oneself during a learning experience so that people don't get sway one way or another uh, based on rumors. That's the basic idea. The other thing of critical thinking is being able to listen and change one's uh, mind or opinion when new facts sur surfaces. And again, this is kind of against human nature. So we need to uh, get started very early on and say, you know, standing to be corrected is actually a virtue. Uh, it is not about losing face or anything. And this is the other aspect that I think are very important. So starting how old, how, what age would Taiwan is? So the, the entire K-12 system, that is to say, uh, starting from the first grade uh, all the way to senior high school, because this is not a class. This is uh, one of the literacy that needs to be merged into all the classes. So all the classes, the teachers and the textbook makers and schools need to find some way to find uh, media literacy and critical thinking into the way they're teaching and not just taking it as a class, as an examination. Uh, I'll have um, just one more. What was your reactions um, in your country like when you were first appointed? I mean, mm -hmm. You're the number one, you're the hacker. Mm -hmm. So people may be worried that, mm -hmm. you know, how can hacker be working for the government? Mm -hmm. Hacker can attack. Hacker is usually seen as somebody who attacks the mm -hmm. government. Like lawyers. Yeah, no. or <laughs> maybe lawyers. <laughs> Yeah, and number two, you're the, I mean, in South Korea, we had a mm -hmm. high government official who come out of closet and mm -hmm. was like a publicly mm -hmm. transgender. It would 
instill huge outrage? Mm -hmm. Did you see experience any of those outrage mm -hmm. in Taiwan as well? Well, not at all, because first, uh, I started working with public service in 2014 after the Sunflower Movement. So for many career public servants, I'm already very well known as one of the people who helped them to communicate, to facilitate conversation with citizens. So uh, in many cases, in people in administration, they call me kind of a understudy minister already uh, for a couple of years before I joined the cabinet working for the previous minister of cyberspace, Jacqueline Tsai. So um, so what I'm saying is that if people had some outrage or whatever, it already happened uh, 2014. It's not uh, waiting after I become a cabinet minister. That's the first. The second thing about hackers. Um, I think in Taiwan, because cybersecurity is very, very a serious matter, people put a lot of understanding into it. So they don't really have this like magical thinking that thinks hackers are somehow magicians. Uh, they understand this is just one kind of technology. And technologists, just like any locksmith or whatever, uh, has their pride, has their professional code of conduct, and things like that. So just like pe when people know a lot about law, maybe they, they exploit the loophole of law and become very bad lawyers. But, but they don't have to be, right? They can become lawmakers that makes a better kind of law that is not going to be exploited. So I think it's much the same. I understand information technology, but it doesn't mean that I will exploit its loopholes. It means that I will set up a system that doesn't suffer from the same kind of loopholes. Since you're, you're at the hacking competition, mm -hmm. is it in, getting more important these days for the government to mm -hmm. foster more hackers? Like yeah, 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 verily. Um, the first thing I did after joining the cabinet was actually recompile the Linux kernel uh, to add uh, secure computing to our internal government information security facilities, which is the system that we use every day. And then we then invited uh, penetration testers, which are security experts who try to attack the system them and to find the loopholes so that we can rest assured that when we are using the system, we configure it properly and so on. So we take this very seriously and we believe that a active uh, penetration testing and forensics and all these tools enables us to have a clear understanding of our information technology infrastructure and its limitations so that we use it in a responsible manner. Otherwise, it's just all voodoo and hearsay, which is... Uh, pretty much the worst case because then people will take some countermeasures that then cause side effects and so on. So I think a, a clear understanding of the cybersecurity landscape is uh, for everybody's benefit. What about the growing um, uh, intergovernmental or allegedly intergovernmental cyber uh, attacks? Mm -hmm. so there's uh, allegations of North Korea attack mm -hmm. South Korea, for example. Mm -hmm. There are allegations of cyber terrorism mm -hmm. between China and the United States. Does that make us more important to have more hackers in the in the government today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think just like with any other terrorism, uh, the the impact itself uh, is actually low. The thing that they hope for is to provoke some mysterious fear and then have people overreact. And the overreaction actually uh, causes more damage than the, the initial attempt at uh, the cyber terrorism or real world terrorism. So it's like a mosquito trying to you know, get onto a bowl and then to, to break things into a, a store. So the, the whole idea is to have a calm, and clear understanding and have cybersecurity experts explaining in a very clear, accessible manner what exactly is happening. And then people would not panic and they will not clamor for things that will actually cause more damage. And I think literacy, again, is the most important thing here. So that connects with your education about the media mm -hmm. literacy and um, just one more about, I think a lot of, there's some Taiwanese people who believe that the rumors that circulate in Taiwan may be behind that there is China. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's one reason that uh, Taiwan should increase its uh, education and media mm -hmm. literacy? Because well, um, in Taiwan, there, there are many ideological camps. There's pro-unification, there's pro-independence, there's everything in between. Uh, and I think uh, these camps are more than sufficient to generate uh, credible rumors without being remote controlled by any other places or any other groups. 
that said, uh, I think uh, it is important for people to get inoculated against this kind of virus of mind. And deliberation, as uh, you already mentioned, I think is the key for the inoculation. Because any effect, fact-checking or whatever, after a rumor has already spread, only has a containment effect. But if people have already considered carefully even the position of people they don't disagree, uh, they don't agree with, they already have some kind of inoculation in the mind so that they will not fall or victim to rumors. And I think really this kind of early stage prevention is the key here. So just by getting people to listen to the ideas that they don't like, basically, is develop, develops their immunology system. I think your view on this um, fake news, mm -hmm. um, I only use this term because that's what my readers are familiar with, uh, it's very refreshing. Could mm -hmm. you comment on the US, uh, Donald, uh, mm -hmm. Trump, US President Donald Trump mm -hmm. about um, how his the way he communicates with the mm -hmm. public? Do you think his, uh, the way he uh, names some of the news media as a mm -hmm. fake news outlet? What, what, what do you think about that? Mm. Well, um, when Twitter first got invented, um, people used Twitter in, in, in the way that's very direct and make full use of the 140 characters. Um, Taiwanese people use Twitter more like regular blogging because in 140 Chinese characters, you can say a lot. Uh, but, but in English, not so much. So, um, so I think there's a distinct style difference in the ways that we use Twitter versus an English speak speaker use of Twitter. They had to be very brief and basically just say even just one idea or half of an idea. So um, as things developed, uh, my social because I was in developing social media uh, networks, uh, we see a lot of very creative uses in, in Twitter, like multi-part tweets, uh, like the tweets that are uh, complementing each other using hashtags and conversation communities, and so on. So they built a, a, a community structure out of those very short forms of communication. Um, but Donald Trump used Twitter uh, the way when it was first invented, uh, <laughs> used it as it meant to be. So it's, to me, also very refreshing. I learned a lot. What do you learn from his <laughs> way of using Twitter? So basically, you have self contained messages. Self contained? Contained messages that doesn't rely on context. Can you elaborate? <laughs> Can I elaborate? Yeah. Well, I think that was pretty self-contained. <laughs> the, the, the idea is that uh, if I have make a very long speech and where each sentence depends on the context of the sentence before and after, then when any one of those sentences gets taken out of context, uh, it will be uh, turned into something that I don't already mean. Right, but if I make all my messages self-contained and short, uh, then there's no danger of being taken out of context. So this is the, the basic thing that I learned. Not necessarily from Donald Trump, but, but it is the idea of Twitter at this beginning. Oh, I don't want to um, take all your time, which is exactly my question. I just want to hear this so you think your career path is quite very impressive and somewhat special. So I heard that you learned programming by yourself after dropping out of middle school, middle school. So what would be the reason? No, I learned programming uh, when I was eight uh, right. years old. Uh, so that was seven years before I dropped out of uh, middle school. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Would you like to translate? Uh, uh, no. Is English okay? You can just speak okay. in English. And That's great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I started uh, very early on to take an interest in mathematics. And uh, I started reading programming language books when I was eight. And uh, they describe a way for people to very quickly get results of mathematics without having to do all the calculations by hand. And there's it's much less error prone. So I got very interested, but I didn't have a computer. So I basically just took a pencil and paper and drew keyboard and you know typed on paper and then wrote what the computer would say and, and so on. So basically I drew a paper computer. But this means that computational thinking is one way of thinking. It is, doesn't depend on the machine. Uh, and if one structure, one thought in some way, the, some part of the thought process can be automated. So for me, it is like learning a uh, music instrument without having access to the piano or to the oboe instrument. So the idea is just to learn the idea of uh, melodies and chords and chords and so on, so that people can play this kind of music. <laughs> and after a few months, 
I actually started programming on a real personal computer, and then I found that uh, you know those those notes that I learned as programming languages actually makes melodies that are shaped spaces around the spaces in which people can interact with each other. The first programs that I wrote are computer games where people can play with each other, against each other, and so on. So that also characterizes how people behave uh, around each other by creating a space of people's interaction. So this is a, a very special kind of instrument, I would say. While learning it, it's just like learning any other musical instrument. The notes it creates is actually a new kind of space where people can interact. Um. You are a civic hacker when you were 33, right? Mm -hmm. And what kind of activities did you focus on and mm -hmm. what were your goals at the time? So um, I'm always a civic hacker. I started working on uh, internet human right and, and uh, freedom of speech movements uh, at least since 1996. Uh, that's during the uh, Blue Ribbon campaign and so on. So, um, yeah, I'm always a civic hack, I would say. And uh, the primary thing, of course, is the sharing of the, the knowledge and uh, making the process of sharing also a common knowledge. So, uh, as uh, early hackers, we all believe that the tools that we use to shape our lives is more and more taking over the role that was initially uh, taken by laws. So more and more, we're living in a case where algorithms, where computer code, already determine what is possible and what is not possible, even before the legal code kicks in. So uh, the problem being that the computer code was not transparent, and people using the computer code doesn't really know why it went to here and has no freedom to modify it or to distribute its modification. So I would say that my core concern is still this kind of uh, internet freedom, with software freedom being one part of it, but also freedom of speech, of assembly, and of other human rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question would be, why do you think security, cybersecurity mm -hmm. matters the most in the fourth, in the mm -hmm. era of the fourth industrial mm -hmm. revolution? And if there is mm -hmm. any example you can give, please. Mm -hmm. Right. The security matters a lot because um, if people are still using internet for freedom of speech and of assembly, people must know for sure, not just blindly trusting, that the speech they make on the internet will not be used against them. So if uh, the internet it becomes a technology that oppresses people, then when people are going to you know have assemblies or have expressed their freedom, they will go back to to pen and paper or to you know face to face meeting and 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 the internet will lose its original liberating promise of getting people who did who feel that they are alone and they don't have people who think like them into communities. So basically, if we don't do our job right on security on the internet, the internet becomes a fragmenting force instead of a, a community force. And if it becomes a com commu uh, fragmenting force, people will have a lot of small intranets, like a balkanization of internet. And each intranet will have an exclusionary uh, policy that excludes people who don't think like them. And then so it will not foster uh, cross-community dialogue and uh, us will become a much more fragmented space where people live essentially in their own realities. And, and that is a as undemocratic, as non-humane as we can imagine if we extrapolate this trend further. So I think the utmost importance is to get people to still see internet as a secure place by having the literacy of telling insecure communication with secure communication and keep to the secure communication methods and so that people can still form communities where it still becomes possible to talk with strangers, to learn from strangers. So this is another question about security because we have now self-driving cars and AI robots, so many things. And he would like to um, listen to some more examples. Why is it specifically more important um, security is in AI and self-driving cars? Hmm. So security, um, th this word in English is very interesting because it describes both a property of a system and also a state of mind. I feel secure versus a secure, secured system, right? Um, so in, uh, in uh, Mandarin Chinese, in the language that we use, 
we say uh, zi an, meaning the the an, meaning that at ease, a calmness uh, with information. And this is important when I'm sitting in a self-driving car, for example, it, because if the system is mathematically proven, it is it, it satisfies a lot of properties. It, all the engineers, everybody vouch for it. If their uh, proof carrying code and all those advanced verification mechanisms cannot translate it to the language that everybody, common people, understands, they may achieve the mathematical definition of security, but there is no psychological or sociological definition of security, of feeling secure. And for me, feeling secure is, is the goal. And this is just the, 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 the you know, mechanism, the instrumentation for it. On the other hand, there is a lot of what we call security theater, which means that not going through the rigorous mathematical proof, but just to, to enact some theater and trick people into believing, uh, into feeling secure about something that's actually not very secure. And if you go to those security theaters for, for this is a, a lot like rumors, if you get uh, a lot of security theaters, uh, the people lose the ability to tell a rigorous system versus a non-rigorous system. And I think this is of utmost importance because if people cannot tell a rigorous system versus a non-rigorous system, people will not ask technology what they want uh, to feel secure. People will just blindly accept whatever the vendors push to them. And this creates a false sense of security. But then when uh, cyber terrorism or other attacks happen, people will panic because they did not know that their system, which they rely on, doesn't have the property that they imagine that they have. So again, I think as the AI and IoT technologies becomes part of not only our life, but become part of ourselves, um, it, is very important, just like uh, the medical knowledge enables us to know what is happening with my own body, my extended body also needs the same kind of self-introspection and knowledge so that I can feel at ease with an extended part of my body. For many people, their phone or their smartwatch is already part of their body. Do we have time to ask um, one more question? Yeah. Can I have one more question regarding mm -hmm. these answers? Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Like you, like you just mentioned, the autonomous car inside. Mm -hmm. People, I mean, the producers of the autonomous car, we always say that this is a safe, but mm -hmm. it could be, like, like you mentioned, there's a security theater mm -hmm. because we do not know that the autonomous mm -hmm. car is really safe or not. Mm -hmm. Because we, we cannot really tell, the technology mm -hmm. is so complex, the artificial mm -hmm. intelligence technology cannot really interpret it to people's daily languages. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And perhaps you could understand it, but mm -hmm. I really mm -hmm. do not understand mm -hmm. that. So, how can we assure that people? that the autonomous vehicle is really safe. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, first, we can do it through simulation. Uh, you can invent some simulation scenario and try to put the algorithms in and see if it behaves the way you think it should behave. Okay, and, yeah, and this yeah. is how actually we test uh, real human testers right. Uh, also, right? So the human testers describe the situation to human drivers when they're taking the driver's test and, and see whether they have the good. Uh, and this is... If, uh, essentially the same that we put the pilots also into in their uh, cockpit simulations. So basically, I think uh, as the spirit of Turing test, if uh, a uh, AI can handle all the situations that human can imagine and throw out of it at uh, throw at it at a simulation, then we can judge it based on how it thinks and explains itself uh, under simulation scenarios. But at the moment, there's still or always somebody behind the wheel to take over uh, when the machine feels that they don't have the confidence to handle the situation. So another very important thing is the human machine handoff, right? We need to have augmented reality system projected on the window of the car to have the driver know what the AI is thinking about the situation and not just very low bandwidth SMS like messages because that would be too late. So it's very important to have this co-piloting me mechanism between the AI pilot and the human driver for the foreseeable future b before we can even think about going into fully autonomous driving. Um, can I ask you some, mm -hmm. do you mind talking about some personal life? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was your family's response to your decision to go through the, mm -hmm. through the transition from men to woman? And mm -hmm. which, could you tell us about your plans for your uh, whether you have a family, whether you have a plan to start a family, mm -hmm. things like that? Yeah. Okay, well, um, my my family uh, is really non-rigid uh, as far as gender stereotype goes. 
uh, my mom was uh, very expressive and uh, was raised kind of a, in a very androgynous uh, manner. And so they don't tell me what a man or a woman should or shouldn't do. So instead of transition, I would say that I am just post-gender, a post-genre, meaning that I don't think there should be things that only one gender should do. I think anything that is declared this way is discrimination. So uh, I'm more against discrimination than against any kind of uh, particular gender identity. That's, that's the first. So when I developed this kind of thoughts, when I was a adolescent, I think they're, they're, they think of a more philosophical um, stance rather than a, you know, psychological thing, right? So um, I think they're pretty friendly uh, and we keep dialoguing and even when I decide to change my name, I make sure that my new name is okayed by my father <laughs> and, and that he also thinks it's a good name uh, before I uh, change my name into it. As for family, I already have a family. Um, it's just not uh, human children. Uh, I live with seven cats and two dogs, um, and have been living with them for ten years now. So, so it, it is a very large family. It's just not human children, and I I do plan to to continue living with them. Oh, so two cats. And two ca uh, two Sorry. dogs and seven cats. Seven cats. Yeah. Oh wow! I have, mm -hmm. I have two cats. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I consider them my children as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, any final thing? Uh, it's good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. That was very, uh, yeah. very interesting. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. I might have to...